This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you need a website or a domain, visit squarespace.com. Hey everybody and welcome to a new video. Do you have a problem with photos where your subject isn't in focus, your focus is on the background rather than your subject, or not all of the scene is in focus like you hoped? In this video, I'm going to share my very best techniques so you can nail that focus every time. And don't forget to stay till the end where I'll share a tip that will make your camera focus faster than ever, even on quick moving subjects. My name is Simon D'Entremont and I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for wildlife and nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. Now I've already made a video on focus settings. So this one will be focused on field techniques. To see that video focused, pun intended, on settings, have a look here, but come back. So what does being in focus mean anyway? And what is this depth of field thing? I need to explain these to you for my advice later to make any sense. First, the depth of field is the part of the photo, kind of a slice in space, between the nearest point and the furthest point where the photo is in acceptably sharp focus. I say acceptably sharp as focus doesn't go from poor to perfect all at once. So the area in focus is the place where light rays converge to a point and a small area in front of this and behind this that are of acceptable focus will look acceptably sharp to us in a photo. The thinner the depth of field, the blurrier the background looks. The deeper the depth of field, the more in focus the background and foreground will be. There are three variables that will affect this depth of field. One, getting closer will make the depth of field thinner. Consequently, being farther makes the depth of field deeper. Two, longer focal lengths will make the depth of field thinner. While at f4, my 16 millimeter lens may have lots of the image in focus, on my 600 millimeter lens at f4, only a thin slice is in focus and the background gets very, very blurry. And three, smaller apertures, that is larger f numbers, make the depth of field deeper. So shooting at f11 has much more of the image in focus than f2.8, which has a thinner depth of field. Let's tackle focus issues by genre, as that's how most people will come across them in real life. One of the keys to understanding how to use the depth of field to your advantage in landscapes and architecture or any genre where you want large expanses in focus is to know if your depth of field is deep enough to include the whole image. And to know that, we need to understand something called the hyperfocal distance. This is the distance at which everything beyond this distance can be brought into an acceptable focus. At the hyperfocal distance, the focus area will start at half the distance to the focus point and extend all the way to infinity. So focused here, everything from here, half the distance to infinity here will be in focus. You can use apps to calculate hyperfocal distance for you. I use an app called PhotoPills to plan my astrophotography and it even includes hyperfocal tables. So let's say I'm using this 16 millimeter lens wide open at f2.8 and I want to photograph a flower at one meter or three feet away, but also get the mountains in the distance basically at infinity in focus. According to these tables, the hyperfocal distance for this combination of camera, focal length and aperture is three meters or about 10 feet and the closest part of the photo in focus would be half of that, 1.5 meters or five feet. The flower is too close to be in focus, but as we saw earlier, smaller apertures can make the depth of field deeper. If we reduce the aperture size by making the F number F4.5, the new hyperfocal distance is just under two meters and the closest point in focus is half of that, less than one meter. So now our flower is in focus as well as the mountain, by making our aperture a smaller f4.5 from the original f2.8. The lesson here is that the smaller the aperture, the closer the hyperfocal distance, and the better odds that everything will be in focus. Also, the fact that this is a very wide lens makes the hyperfocal distance closer too. The f2.8 hyperfocal distance on this 50 millimeter lens is 30 meters, not three meters like the 16 millimeter lens. The corollary here is if you want everything in focus, use shorter focal lengths, as longer focal lengths have shallower depths of field. For this shot, these rock structures in the foreground are only a meter away. How did I get them all in focus? Did I use hyperfocal tables? No, I used my knowledge that small apertures and wide angle lenses make for close hyperfocal lengths. 
So I shot this at 24 millimeters and f14, which I knew would make things very close all the way to infinity in focus. In this case, looking up the table after the fact tells me that everything two thirds of a meter or two feet to infinity are in focus. But here's the shortcut I used. Using wide angle lenses, if you place your focus point at the one third point along the scene, you maximize the chances that all is in focus. So focus here in the scene using a single focus point or manually focusing while looking in the back LCD to get the depth of field to start here at the halfway point and go all the way to infinity. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. For many photographers, having our photos on social media has defaulted to somehow become our portfolio. And I'm not sure that's the right direction. Our social media is often a combination of our professional work and our personal lives and sometimes what we're up to and not very well organized. And everyone's got a social media presence these days. But when we want to build credibility with potential clients and differentiate ourselves and present our work for sale, we need a more customized tool for the job. And that's a website like my site I built with Squarespace. Having your own Squarespace website builds a more refined public face for your work, presented and organized like you want it. And websites are far and away superior for commercialization. With a Squarespace site, you can display your products in galleries, have an online store, and even monetize your content by offering memberships to exclusive content in private sections of your website. You can even offer free downloads in exchange for subscribing to your newsletter. I built my own website using Squarespace and it was easy. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Simon to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So let's get back to using smaller apertures for more depth of field. You may be thinking, can I just make the aperture smaller and smaller to make things really, really close in focus too, along with the background. In real life, no. That's because at really high F numbers like F16 or greater, there's a phenomenon called diffraction that actually makes your images softer the smaller you make the aperture. So F14 is about my limit. Don't try F22, for example, to get everything in focus. Also, don't forget that at these really small apertures, you often need long shutter speeds to get enough light, which means getting a tripod. Another workaround to not having enough depth of field to get the whole scene in focus is using focus stacking. I use this in my astrophotography because I can't stop the lens down to f14 in the dark. I need to shoot the Milky Way at fast apertures like f1.4 or 1.6. Also, shooting the dark foreground at f14 would take an hour. It's dark out there. So what I do is I shoot two or three images with thin depths of field, but focus at the foreground, midground, and infinity, and do what's called focus stacking, where I combine them in Photoshop, where I only use the in focus section of each photo, like this, this, and this, and make one composite with all the in focus sections together, like these. A quick note, if you subscribe to my email list, you can download for free my guide to shooting in backlit situations. Link in the description below. Now what if you're not trying to get the whole scene in focus like in a landscape shot, but rather you shoot portraits or wildlife and like a thin depth of field to get nice blurry backgrounds to make your subject pop from the frame. This is often done with longer focal lengths like a portrait using a 70 to 200 f2.8 or wildlife at 600 millimeter f4. What do you do then? First, the depth of field is very thin on these setups. A 200 millimeter lens at f2.8 at five meters distance only has a depth of field of a few centimeters, an inch or two. On my 600 millimeter lens, it's only a few millimeters. This means three things. One, to get things in really good focus, we need our focus point to be accurate. With portraits or wildlife, we often want the eye to be in focus. But with the depth of field so razor thin, we need to get the eye dead on. Otherwise an eyebrow or a beak will catch our focus point. One tip is to choose the smallest focus point you can amongst your focus point choices on your camera. Avoid larger focus modes that have several points and use eye detect if you have it, it's a great feature. Two, make sure you're using continuous autofocus and not one shot if your subject is moving and you're shooting in bursts. If you're in one shot, your first shot will be in focus and not the others. Or even the slightest movement of a few millimeters will make the eye slightly out of focus if your focus is locked on like in one shot mode. And third, increase the depth of field if it's just too thin by stopping down your lens a bit. Taking portraits with an 85 millimeter f1.4 lens can be a real challenge with super thin depths of field. If the background is far enough behind your subject, you can always make the aperture a bit smaller like f2.8 
and both make it easier to get the eye in focus, but also get all the features of the model in focus, and you can still get a blurry background. The same thing with wildlife. You don't need to shoot a lens at its widest aperture. When birds get really close to me, the depth of field gets super thin, so I'll sometimes stop the lens down a bit to f5 or f5.6 to get more of the subject in focus, like in these photos of mine. By the way, you may be wondering out of curiosity, with really long focal lengths like 600 millimeters, what is the hyperfocal distance? That is, at what distance would everything be in focus in a lens like that? Well, at f4, it's three kilometers, almost two miles. So when I'm shooting big surf, like in this footage, a kilometer away, I can't actually get everything in focus, but it matters not. Here's a surf shot taken at 500 millimeters from almost a kilometer away. The fact that the foreground isn't tack sharp and not in focus isn't an issue. One problem that people have in capturing action in focus is getting the focus to lock on to your subject, be it wildlife, fast cars, or pets. They end up focused on the background and the subject is soft. One field technique to help your camera get both a fast focus and an accurate one is to pre-focus. That means placing your focus on a distance that's equal to where you think the action is likely to happen. The more in focus and visible it is, the easier it is for your camera to find it and start focusing on it. The physical distance that the lens needs to move the lens elements to get in focus is less and will take less time to happen for a faster focus. In short, the closer your focus is to the plane where the subject will appear, the faster and more accurately everything about focus will happen. So how do you implement this in the field? The trick is that when you expect some action, point at something close to that distance, a tree, a fence, a clump of grass, and hit the focus button. Then after you've focused, take your finger off the button and leave the camera focused at that distance. Wait for your subject to arrive, and when they do, point at it and hit the focus button. It should acquire it much more quickly. Another tip is that many cameras, especially mirrorless cameras, are better at pushing the focus out than pulling it in. So given the choice between pre-focusing right in front of you or at infinity, pre-focus close to you, avoiding the phenomenon of the camera focus being stuck on the background, which can be hard to recover from. If you found this video deserving, please give it a like and YouTube will share it with other photographers struggling with focus issues, helping them to get that shot in focus. And I hope that you can use these tips too the very next time you go out to come home with your own unique and in focus photos. I know you can do it.